Hello and welcome to this episode of The Cyclo Edition, the podcast for those looking to go above and beyond in their understanding of the organic literature. I'm Wesley Swords, and I'm joined today by Stephen Chapman and Matt Genzink. The paper we will be discussing today is titled A 16-Step Synthesis of the Isoryanodane Diterpene Plus Persianol by the group of Sarah Reisman, who is a professor of chemistry at the California Institute of Technology. Her group is focused on the discovery, development, and study of new chemical reactions within the context of natural product total synthesis. Today's paper describes the synthesis of plus persianol in an anti-selective fashion through the use of a convergent synthetic route. So today we're going to talk about Sarah Reisman's recent Nature paper, uh, which is a really efficient synthesis of persianol. This natural product is structurally similar to ryanodal and ryanodine, which are two products that she made uh, just a few years ago, uh, published in Science. Yes, ryanodine and ryanodal have a core, um, it's called the ryanodane core, which is a 655 tricyclic structure, which then has, of course, a lot of functional groups dotted along it. There's also the isoryanodane core, which is a 565 core, and that is the family that uh, persianol is related to. All three of these compounds, as well as um, structural variants, were isolated out of plants as natural products in the, in the early 1950s and since then. Yeah, so members of this family of compounds modulate ryanodine receptors, which are just ligand-gated ion channels that are critical for intracellular calcium signaling. And specifically, ryanodine has been used as an insecticide. Actually, a number of years ago, peaking in the 1950s as Reisman points out, a certain insecticide had ryanodine as the active ingredient. So ryanodine has this parole to carboxylate ester functional group, which is required for binding to the mammalian ryanodine receptors, whereas persianol doesn't have that functional group. So the idea here is that while ryanodine might have activity towards insects, and humans, something like persianol that doesn't have this parole to carboxylate ester may only be active towards insects and not towards humans. So as Stephen mentioned, um, Sarah Reisman in 2016 published a 15-step linear synthesis of plus rhinodol. So this came out in Science and was a really um, nice synthesis. It built upon um, two previous syntheses by Inoue and Dale Enchamp, who had both done more than 30 step syntheses of the same molecule. And so it had significantly decreased the number of steps needed to get to Rhinodol. But an important feature of the synthesis was it was just a straight linear sequence. So they had to start and build all of their complexity from a single core molecule. And then following up the synthesis of Rhinodol, the Reisman group then went on to synthesize Ranadine, which is the more applicable insecticide that people were using back in the 1950s. And so basically they started with using basically, they took 11 steps out of their ryanodol synthesis to get to a pretty functionalized core and then added in six to seven more steps to that on that parole to carboxylate ester. Um, and then after adding on that, um, they were able to actually get to the plus ryanodine core in about 18 steps. In both of the cases, they were both just straight linear sequences. So there were no real branches in the synthetic chain, unlike the synthesis of persianol. So in the case of persianol, the authors go after a more convergent synthesis, where they're taking the natural product and disconnecting it into a number of different fragments. In this case, it's two main fragments. And in the synthetic direction, building up those fragments and then connecting them near the end of the synthesis. So really establishing complexity near the end of the synthesis rather than in the beginning. So in general, convergent syntheses are thought to be higher yielding and take fewer steps. In the case where you potentially have a linear sequence versus a convergent synthesis that have the same number of steps, the convergent synthesis is going to have a higher yield than the linear sequence. So kind of as a corollary to what Wes was saying just about the strategy of a convergent synthesis is that it's better to establish complexity near the end of a synthetic root rather than the beginning. So Reisman recently retweeted a quote from Hoffman, Hoffman from the, the famous Woodward Hoffman rules, kind of that kind of embodies this idea. The quote says, how is the complexity of a structure related to synthesis planning? One should start with the following truism. Reactions with simple molecules proceed readily and in high yields. Complex molecules are frequently touchier and tend to form side products even in simple looking transformations. 
Well, this is certainly not a natural law, most chemists would attribute considerable truth to this statement. The consequence for planning a synthesis is this. Keep the number of steps low once your intermediates have become increasingly complex. A rapid increase in complexity early in a synthesis sequence frequently faces low yields and the many operations that follow. Sequences involving overbred molecular skeletons, i.e. those with complexity higher than the following intermediates or the target structure, can be justified only when they allow a substantial reduction in the overall number of steps. Based on the above considerations, a late exponential increase of complexity in a synthesis sequence is most desirable. So basically just saying there, it's better to establish complexity late, like we've been saying, and that's what they do in the synthesis of perceanol that we're going to get into. So getting back to the structure of perceanol, there's a lot of complexity built into this small molecule, uh, including a seven-membered lactole, two syndiols, and a highly oxidized pentacycle. Uh, there's also a quaternary center that they assemble through one of their cascade reactions that we'll talk about later. So they start by looking at their retrosynthetic plan for getting um, to perseanol through this conversion th synthesis. And so they start with plus perseanol, and then um, through an oxidative deconstruction, they get to anhydroperseanol. Um, and so they wanted to do this as th it's the same connection that they use to make ryanidol and ryanidine. And so while the core of perseanol is an isomer to ryanidine, they were fairly confident that this is a precedented connection. Going back further, they removed one of the syndiols, and then they removed the lactone through a carbonyl insertion. And so basically now they've gotten to the point where they're starting to look at deconstructing the core molecule down into its two parts. That would be part of the conversion synthesis. And so they deconstruct the six-membered ring through a palladium cyclization cascade. And then um, through a fragment coupling have now deconstructed rings A and C from the core of the isoryanidane structure. I think the really key step here is that palladium cascade reaction because starting you're going from basically two tethered cyclopentyl groups. So only two of the five rings are established. And after that reaction, uh, the goal is that four out of the five rings will be established, including that seven membered ring lactone. So one of the best insights that I liked about her retrosynthetic analysis was uh, when she built this palladium cascade reaction. So going in the forward direction, after you do your palladium oxidative insertion from 8 to intermediate 7, then she sees that not only does that build the third ring in perceanol, you can then use that palladium species to continue with your carboxylative reaction uh, to assemble that fourth ring. So her retrosynthetic analysis used a palladium species that was not necessarily stable in itself, but saw the reactivity that you could use uh, and harnessed it for that cascade reaction. So jumping into the synthesis in the forward direction, we're going to build up the two fragments uh, that they kind of build up as small molecules to then couple in this convergent synthesis. And so, so they start by building ring C, which is one of the five membered rings on the iso ryanidane core through the use of R plus pulagone, which is a, just a chiral six membered ketone. So they initially do a ring contraction through the use of bromine and a base to give them their five membered core um, with a methyl ester off of it. So going from this five-membered core, they then do an enolization through um, KHMDS, and then the addition of oxygen and trimethylphosphite. And so this just gives you an anti-alcohol to the um, methyl group from Fuligone. Then going from this, um, so this is compound 13, they then use MCPBA to do a hydroxide-directed epoxidation of the dimethyl alkene. So that going forward, they add in diethyl aluminum tetramethylpipiride, which induces a epoxide isomerization to give you the 1,2 syndiol and um, an alkene off of one of the two methyls. From that, they, they protect the, the syndiol as an acetal. They then reduce the ester down to an alcohol using diabol and then oxidize it back up to the aldehyde using stall conditions. One thing to note here is that they go from the ester, reduce it down to a primary alcohol, and then oxidize that alcohol to the aldehyde. 
that's just because reducing an ester to an aldehyde is very hard. It's hard to stop at the aldehyde and not go all the way to the alcohol. So in this case, they did a reduction followed by an oxidation. The product after these six steps is one of the two fragments that they're going to use then in the late stage coupling to give you the more complex core of perseanol. So next they build up their A-ring fragment and they start with a vanilligous ester to do a zinc enolization to add in to an alkyl iodine species to generate compound 21. They note that they do this ring fragment in a racemic way instead of doing it in antioselective because of the possibility of racemizing that alpha position of the vanilligous ester. So later they will deracemize their final product, but we're going to continue forward under racemic conditions for now. So next they do an iodination reaction to install an iodine uh, to the alkene. So after iodination, they do hydrolysis with sodium hydroxide to form a diketone. The next step is taking the newly formed ketone and transforming it into a vinyl bromide. They do this through stoichiometric oxaliobromide and catalytic DMF. That, that combination of oxaliobromide and DMF basically forms an amino uh, brominating agent to form that vinyl bromide. The interesting thing here now is that they have both a vinyl iodide and a vinyl bromide, and both of these are going to be used as handles for further functional group conversions later on in the synthesis. At this point, they need to kinetically resolve the two enantiomers of the product that they just formed. So basically, the general principle of a kinetic resolution is that when there are two enantiomers in the presence of a chiral catalyst, one enantiomer will react faster than the other leading to a product that is enantiomerically pure, um, and then the other enantiomer doesn't react, it just stays as the starting material. The way that works is, in this case, you can think of having two enantiomers of the starting material as R and S. In this case, the catalyst is R. Um, so, basically, so basically, that results in two different diastereomeric transition states, one with RR and one with RS. And those diastereomeric transition states have different energies, which results in a different pace of the reaction, a different speed of the reaction. So one enantiomer will react faster than the other. The one downside of a kinetic resolution is that only one of the enantiomers leads to the product that you're looking for. So the maximum theoretical yield of any kinetic resolution is 50%. So in this case, to do the kinetic resolution and the reduction of their enol, they use the Cori Bakshi Shibata um, reduction reaction. This uses a chiral boron, an antioselective reduction catalyst, basically. Um, a lot of early graduate students will learn it as the CBS catalyst. Um, and so this gives them their product in about a 44% yield. As Matt mentioned, that's pretty good considering your perfect yield would be a 50% for this reaction in 91% EE. And um, then going forward, all they do is protect the alcohol on this ring and that gives them their basically precursor for ring A in six steps. And so over the course of these two different linear syntheses, they've now been able to build the precursor for ring C and ring A both in six steps. So now they couple these two main ring fragments together and, and they do this using a lithium halogen exchange with the vinyl iodine that they had just assembled and it adds in to their aldehyde and that adds into the aldehyde from ring C, giving you a new carbon-carbon bond and a secondary alcohol. This sets them up for their palladium cascade reaction that they do some pretty extensive optimization on. Yeah, so like Stephen was saying, they just kind of tethered together those two cyclopentyl fragments that they had built up, and now they have this vinyl bromide as a handle for the cyclization cascade. So looking specifically at some of the fundamental steps that they're hoping will operate under this cascade, in the presence of palladium, Ideally, that vinyl bromide will undergo oxidative addition, and that palladium intermediate will then migratory insert into the 1,1 alkene. At this point, a sigma alkyl palladium species is generated, 
And in an atmosphere of carbon monoxide, ideally the CO will insert into that palladium carbon bond and that intermediate will be trapped by the alcohol to form the seven-membered lactone. When they tried the cyclization and carbonyl addition under standard conditions, which would be using a palladium zero catalyst and a, a one atmosphere of um, carbon monoxide, they did see some reactivity towards 31, which is their ring-closed seven-membered lactone. However, after about 20 minutes, they only formed about 11% of this product. And then going to 90 minutes with a overstoichiometric amount of the palladium catalyst could only ever get them to about 53% of their product. And they wanted to be able to try and use palladium on a catalytic scale, or at least you know, not be using stoichiometric amounts of palladium to get a 50% yield of their product. They say they did an extensive screening, um, and so they tried... Palladium tetricus saw similar results, but some remaining starting material. But some of the conclusions that they came out of this initial screening, they hypothesized that carbon monoxide was inhibiting their palladium catalyst. And then one of the major side products they saw was direct carbonylation of the initial vinyl bromide to give them a butyral lactone before they could do the initial ring closure and to give them their six-membered ring, preventing any like potential formation of the seven-membered lactone. And so what they hypothesized was that they could use in situ generation of CO to maintain low concentrations of CO favor the six-membered ring formation, and then allow the carbonylation of the lactone to occur. And so um, ultimately what they were able to do was um, use N-formal saccharin as a carbon monoxide source with KF as an additive. And under the conditions where they had 50 mole percent of palladium tetricus, they were able to get a 57% yield with a slight bit of remaining starting material and some of the butyral lactone. And so this was the best yield they were able to get under these conditions and so that was what they went forward with. So after this palladium cascade reaction they deprotect uh, one of the alcohols using DDQ uh, to give you that secondary allylic alcohol. So the choice of the PMB protecting group here was probably pretty strategic. The PMB protecting group is a benzyl protecting group and these can be deprotected uh, through an oxidation. What basically DDQ is doing is just oxidizing that protecting group and that's strategic here because in the presence of acid, the acetyl protecting group may be deprotected. De um, and in the presence of base, that lactone also could potentially fall apart. They chose the PMB protecting group here likely because they could deprotect it through an oxidation and the rest of the molecule would be able to tolerate that. So with the secondary alcohol in hand, they use DMDO to oxidize it to the enone and then use a methyl magnesium chloride reagent to do the methylation uh, in a stereo specific way. So the methyl group simply adds to the bottom face of the molecule so the nucleophilic attack won't occur over the seven membered lactone. One interesting point over these two steps as well is that when they do the DMDO oxidation, they actually oxidize up their protected diol that they protected way earlier in the initial synthesis of ring C. Basically, they deprotect one of the alcohols and now have a benzoate protected alcohol on that ring. And this becomes important in this next step where under acidic conditions, this benzoate ends up adding in to the alkene of ring A it basically installs one of the alcohols of the second dial needed for the synthesis of Persianol. The intermediate that they show is intermediate 40, where now you have the diols protected across the central six-membered ring as a carbocation. And then the third alcohol that was left over from your initial diol attacks that carbocation to give you a protected trial. And yeah, they said that this was just kind of uh, an accidental discovery that they did, uh, and it did require them to rethink the rest of their synthesis. As we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, they were expecting to just install that secondary syndiol uh, in one of their steps, uh, as they show in their retrosynthetic analysis. But now that they've installed that third alcohol uh, on the bottom face of the molecule, they had to figure out a new way forward to still get to the proscenial product that they wanted. The next step is an allylic oxidation with selenium dioxide. 
The next step is a vanadium mediated hydroxyl directed epoxidation. Basically, they're now set up to do the ring closure to give them their pentacyclic core, and then all they would have to do is deprotect their alcohols, and they're left with um, plus personal. So, to go after this, they follow the same mechanistic style that they did for both the rhinodol and rhinodine syntheses, where they want to generate an anion on the lactone structure which will then attack the epoxide, leaving them with their, their core structure for percinol. And they mentioned that they had to screen reducing agents to allow them to get at this anion. After this extensive optimization, they landed on lithium phenylnaphtaline. They had to use a pretty good excess and ended up with only a 25% yield for the pentacyclic core. The next step was then a palladium on carbon catalyzed hydrogenation to um, remove the protecting group and they were left with plus percinol as the single enantiomer. As they note at the end of the paper, this is the first total synthesis of percinol uh, that's been reported. And this really highlights the convergent synthesis strategy that they used, which works really nicely and, and gives fairly high yields of their complex natural product over a 16 step longest linear sequence. Yeah, this is really kind of a roller coaster of a total synthesis. And I guess that's pretty characteristic of all total syntheses in that you encounter a lot of <laughs> unexpected uh, twists and turns along the way. But that was the case here as well. It was kind of cool because as they encountered those synthetic hurdles, they you know kind of rethought their synthesis. And in some cases, uh, an unexpected product was actually beneficial towards the towards the total synthesis in general. Um, and overall, I really thought this total synthesis was impressive. They highlight using uh, a several different types of techniques and strategies to assemble this complex molecule, including the kinetic resolution to avoid isomerization in one of their ring fragments. Then they optimize and do a very complex palladium cascade reaction that assembles two different rings all in one pot. Then they have this fancy tertiary diol protecting group and assemble the fourth ring using an anionic epoxide ring opening reaction. So there's a lot of new reactions and a lot of new features that are highlighted in this total synthesis, uh, including some strategies that I think we can apply to other syntheses moving forward. And that's our show. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Cyclo Edition. For more information on the papers discussed, we have included a selection of the resources we used in our research at the end of the YouTube video. This was our take on a very interesting paper, and we would love to continue the conversation with you. Please comment below the YouTube video and reach out on social media. You can follow the Cyclo Edition on Twitter, where we will post updates about our next episode. You can find the Cyclo Edition wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. We will provide the paper we will be discussing during the next episode in the description of this podcast, as well as on social media a few days before the next episode is released. 